Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my show Rocket Monday. In today's episode, we're going to talk about SLS RS25 engine. So let's dive right into it. Well, it's a very simple liquid fuel cryogenic rocket engine. What does that simply mean? Simply means it using liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, one of the coldest liquid known to man. So it gets very cold. Now it is a staged Kamban cycle, which is a very big deal because as of now, as of me making this video in 2020, there are very few rocket engines that are completely closed cycle, very few. And uh, most of them are reused everywhere else. Basically think of it this way. Uh, even the SpaceX Merlin engine, that's open cycle, it's not closed cycle. Making a closed cycle engine is a very complicated thing. Doing that with uh, hydrogen makes it easier in one regard, makes it complicated in another regard. So making a closed cycle engine back in, uh, basically its first flight was in 1981, April 1982, that's a very big deal. And it was first targeted, the whole engine was developed in conjunction with Space Shuttle. So it was the main powerhouse for the Space Shuttle. So RS-25 is still going on, so RS-25 actually outlived the space shuttle. Now then the question becomes why the heck we even, um, basically NASA even built it. Well you have to understand it, closed cycle simply reduces any uh, wastage you have. Basically you are, uh, your rocket no matter how cold it is, no matter how hot it is, is simply relying on chemical energy. But when you are running a turbo pump uh, and all you are doing is with this exhaust which is unburnt, either you will have too much fuel which we call fuel rich or you will have uh, too much oxygen which we call oxygen rich. Basically, that is rich. Basically, the chemical energy in those uh, systems is not exploited. You are just letting it out, how the Merlin engine does. So, people really wanted to tap on that energy because that is like 2-3% extra power and also makes your uh, rocket, while powerful, also it makes it uh, more efficient. So, it's a win-win scenario. As long as you can figure it out how to do it, it's very complicated. So, Soviet Union, I'm not talking Russia, Soviet Union in uh, 1960s figured out how to make NK-33, that is the first known engine that successfully achieved oxygen rich basically uh, people wanted to make a closed cycle engine for a very long time as long as they understood thermodynamics problem was if you make it uh, basically fuel rich kerosene rich it's easier to do but kerosene uh, the soot that you will create it will uh, basically clog up everything and it is very destructive then somebody thought okay instead of making uh, you know a fuel rich how about we make it oxygen rich problem is hot oxygen can destroy any metal known to man so somehow soviet union in 19 60 figured out how to make a metal alloy that can withstand it for long enough for a rocket engine to work so that was mind-boggling nasa uh, basically uh, CIA did find it out that uh, it had happened, but they did not believe it. It's like, no, no, it's a propaganda. It cannot be done because it's a very complicated thing. Somehow they had managed to do it. But then again, once, uh, uh, you know, Russia was formed, uh, collaboration started, and then they were like, oh, no, they actually did this. Then the USA was like, dude, we need a closed cycle engine. We need to have it. And that is why many times people will say Soviet Union was actually much ahead in terms of technology. If they did not have internal conflict, they might have even, uh, you know, reached to the moon before uh, America. So it's a very uh, you know kind of tragic kind of scenario. So USA got a fire lit under its ass and they needed an engine. Now they went it for one main target: get me the highest mileage engine possible because uh, that's the whole point of closed cycle. You get very high mileage. They wanted to beat that. Basically, they wanted to make a same statement same they did with Saturn V. It's like this is our record. You cannot even come close to it. Now it must be reusable because even as back as 1969, basically when Apollo 11 was landing, uh, NASA was planning ahead and they were thinking of something reusable, something that will make space uh, much more accessible. So space shuttle was created. For that uh, reason, they wanted to use something that is far more uh, relaxed on the materials so it can be reused again and again and again and again. This was the first reusable engine that was actually reused. So. That is why hydrogen was selected. Hydrogen is uh, good for both of these because unburnt hydrogen is just hydrogen gas. It's not that reactive. And when you are talking about uh, basically exhaust output, you are getting water vapor. Basically, you are steam cleaning the engine itself. So it's a very big deal. And the first maiden flight happened in April 12, 1981, on a white space shuttle. And I'll be like, why the hell is white? Well. Even normal space shuttle is white only. Only difference is the fuel tank is no longer painted. Uh, back in the days, because liquid hydrogen is the coldest liquid, they were like worried that sunlight will heat it up. Once they actually launched it, they figured it out it does not make too much difference. So it was abandoned. It saved weight and made it much more efficient and quick turnaround. So that is why it was built. So these are the politics behind why it was built. So how does it work? So please download the image that I'm showing it here. It's from Wikipedia and uh, I'm providing the link down below and have it in your next monitor or on your mobile phone. That will help you to understand a lot. So 
this uh, engine for its time is way ahead so what it did it had gaseous hydrogen burnt with liquid oxygen now why that's a big deal well most scenarios you generally end up with liquid oxygen and liquid fuel those burning problem with that that does is not very uh, conducive to combustion so you cannot get too much psi combustion pressure as high as you want now if you are familiar with raptors development i already made a detailed video about raptor itself uh, raptors so big deal is basically it not only has uh, gaseous fuel it also has gaseous oxygen Combining both of them in gaseous form makes it very easy to ignite, makes combustion stable and allows you to pump the PSI up. Now this for its time is what damn I hate. It was like way too much PSI on these puppy. So that's how they were achieving it simply because they had gaseous hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Now let's follow the pipeline. Now you start with hydrogen. It is the biggest component. You get into a first turbo charger. Now this is a uh, puppy turbo charger is only there is just like you know help it along it's not main oomph doing it, it's just like helping it along so you have first turbo charger then the fuel going into main turbo charger now this is the expensive part in space shuttle because this is what we call integrated power head now if you think this tur uh, turbine is like you know turbine just imagine this way you remove half of this and you will need that for oxygen that is why oxygen department is so small compared to hydrogen hydrogen does have this side effect it is ludicrously low density so per liter that you have to pump Basically, if you pump one liter of uh, oxygen, you might need 11 liters of uh, basically hydrogen. So you get the idea, like you need, your turbo pump needs a lot of oomph to pump hydrogen basically. That is why the turbo pump section on the hydrogen side is so big. And it also needed helium sealing because if hydrogen, hydrogen has a tendency to leak from everything. So they had it, had to have uh, helium as a suppressant for hydrogen. So they got the first turbo charger now you have to understand we are burning a rocket engine and you are doing it at a very high psi so temperature on the nozzle wall is too damn high it will melt through so the pumped hydrogen which is pressurized at this point but still cryogenic state goes through the uh, basically uh, chamber walls and the nozzle and cools it down it's like okay bro cool it down and then you send it to pre-burners now in the pre-burner it has two pathways uh, half of it's sent to oxidizer other half is sent to fuel system now this is the critical aspect that is why it is different from uh, Raptor system. Raptor has uh, oxygen rich and fuel rich pre burners. This has only fuel rich because they knew uh, basically hot hydrogen is less destructive than hot oxygen. So they have hydrogen coming here, which is still in liquid phase, but it's uh, starting to warm up, basically starting to boil off. They put uh, liquid oxygen little bit. Basically, it's not psychometrically perfect. It's little bit is overflown by like, you know, uh, for every 10 liters of hydrogen, they are putting around uh, half a liter of oxygen. So it is unburned. Now, benefit of that, you get a lot of water vapor, which is completely combustion and uh, has steam cleaning ability. And then you have a lot of hydrogen gas. Now, that is why the pipe thickness is shown here so big. Now, that drives the turbine and goes to the combustion chamber. Same happens happens on the oxygen side also you have liquid hydrogen going burning turning into gaseous because even though combustion energy is less it's still more than enough to convert a cryogenic liquid into a high pressure gas then you have that gas driving the oxygen turbine and then you have the same hydrogen reaching the main chamber now let's follow the oxygen side same thing oxygen comes in you have a small puppy turbo charger charges it up then it goes to the main charger and it directly goes to the engine that is it's uh, basically it's no longer used into cooling the engine or anything else it simply goes into the system now this is one core difference from uh, raptor engine raptor engine this will be also turned into gas it will not go into liquid form now from all this circle you will have uh, another lot of tap of valves basically you will have leaching off little bit here little little of the other reason for that well to drive those puppy charges and uh, to pressurize the fuel tank you have to understand it the tank on this uh, rocket was huge space shuttle fuel tank was huge now you have to understand it was so huge it can drive the engine for upwards of eight minutes basically from sea level to space that is that that is insane amount of fuel uh, basically tank volume now if you have tank like that and mostly of it was uh, basically hydrogen on itself but once you start to drain it drain it drain it and the, the partial vacuum you will start to create in the empty section and uh, no amount of gas you can carry that can fill that up so what they do they basically put a pump a uh, hot hydrogen there it's like you know just go hydrogen there benefit hot hydrogen expands a lot and it pressurizes the liquid one so it also helps uh, liquid oxygen even though it's hot it's uh, basically hot gas pushing on cold liquid cold liquid does not turn into gaseous and it makes sure the uh, turbine does not choke 
and that is done basically you mix hydrogen with hydrogen does nothing happens you mix oxygen with oxygen nothing happens so that's the whole reality you have puppy turbochargers big turbocharger big turbocharger cooling everything and then burning it up oxygen charging it up sending a little bit back and then sending the main amount in the chunk chamber there is no uh, liquid to gaseous conversion and then you get your main exhaust it is a very big deal it's quite amazing they figured out how to make the uh, basically power integrated system it is ludicrously complex f1 engine was complex this puppy is on a different level so what about the nozzle because this is one of the greatest achievement of uh, rs25 that is one of the only engine known so far that literally ignites itself on the sea level and shuts it off in space it's not like in a high altitude it literally shuts it off once it's actually in space so that's a very big deal now why it's a big deal simply because you make a nozzle like this now it's perfect for sea level why because you want exit pressure to match the outside pressure if it does not happen let's say the exit pressure is too much basically your nozzle is too wide the atmospheric pressure will push it down because it's 15 psi the atmosphere is very strong and it will push it down you will have what we call flow surface. basically this is how you're supposed to make your gas layer versus your nozzle wall this is how you're supposed to make. this will happen and the moment it happens it will become unstable and your rocket explodes so how the heck you design a nozzle that literally works from sea level to space because if you don't do this if you're like okay i'm gonna make my nozzle small so if it is completely stable in basically low earth orbit or i'm saying low earth orbit, sea level awesome you can do that but problem is in space you will be losing mileage and you need mileage in space so they created an over expanding nozzle but they curved it back so instead of nozzle being just like this they had like this so this may it may not be uh, you know very obvious and you have to actually physically see it because it's quite subtle but that little bit of uh, folding it backwards added extra pressure here made it stable on sea level and efficient in uh, vacuum of space so that was quite ingenious engineering and the reason that is why it needs so so much cooling to the almost last level basically if you see many other engines you, they don't have cooling going to the last level even in uh, basically spacex vacuum engine you don't see any cooling channel the vac cooling is only done for the combustion chamber here the whole nozzle needed to be cooling because that doing like this that this area heated up a lot so they needed to make sure they have a lot of cooling for that area so that's quite amazing thing then uh, this is one thing that even a national geography documentary messed it up is like uh, to ignite it they had a uh, you know three sparkers that are uh, you know on the launch platform those had nothing to do with ignition those are only there because hydrogen has a tendency to leak that they will keep leaking and uh, once you start the main rocket engine that can add extra explosion to make sure those burn off those uh, excess hydrogen those spark plugs were ignited now how do you actually start this well uh, it is doing the same thing which uh, raptor engine will want to do right now is basically they have a small burner in the center it has a little bit of oxygen little bit of hydrogen perfectly mixed and ignited using an electrical spark plug and it it's basically a blowtorch and uh, it's unpressurized that's why i keep saying like you need to for making a difference between a basically flamethrower versus a, a rocket engine is the pressure you don't have pressure here it's basically very easy to combust and even ignite it this is the same thing a uh, raptor engine wants to do because right now merlin engine uses a third chemical now chemical option reliable but side effect you don't have uh, the luxury of reigniting just again and again and if you are following spacex development you have seen many times they are running out of t-tap it's like boom t-tap run out engine relight failed and crashed so this time they want to use electrical system same as uh, basically uh, space shuttle main engine so it had a central core if you see any injector plate uh, of space shuttle you will see a giant hole in the center and that is the burner plate basically it will start and it will burn off fuel before it like you know uh, any bad blowback can happen now because these three engines are very powerful for their time and even now uh, they were so powerful that it was a bad idea to start them all three at the same time generally in rocketry nobody wants to do that they want to make sure our rocket starts one by one engines as in so there is a 120 millisecond gap between all three engines and uh, i have provided a video high speed video of launch out there you can easily see rockets they start to burn basically the fuel is flowing it's burning but it's flamethrower mode not rocket engine and you can easily see a sound like boom it's like okay engine one is now in rocket mode boom engine two is now on boom engine three is on the reason for that is basically a it reduces stress on the structure and also gives computer enough time to like okay is my engine working so computer is like okay engine on are you on are you actually producing thrust are you sure about this okay so that 120 millisecond is there for that it's like you know are you sure about this so and you can easily see space shuttle like literally bouncing back that's what happens once those three engines start now once the engine is like you know boom everything is go then the main uh, uh, solid boosters are ignited and then the clamp breaks until this point clamp is like holding on to three engines firing at full power clamp is like i'm not gonna let you go the moment uh, the computer is like okay all engines are green uh, ignite the srbs boom 
the clamp breaks and so that's why you will see space shuttle doing like this uh, even though it's uh, still on the clamp and the engines are still ready to start to vibrate like this because if you see the uh, exhaust triangle is like a bit off it's quite interesting to see provided the video down below you should check it out especially that three blast ding 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 so what about sls now sls will use four of these uh, four of these uh, per stage now why four well, they wanted to simplify the design. They wanted to go back to a simpler design. Space Shuttle actually was uh, really bad in terms of what it meant to do, what it ended up doing. They wanted it to be cheap. It ended up more expensive than Saturn V. If you compare per launch cost, combining the cost of everything else. It's supposed to be quick. It ended up very slow. It's supposed to be safe. It ended up killing 14 astronauts. So you get the idea. Like it was bad in every single way. It's supposed to be cheap, failed. It's supposed to be quick, it failed. It's supposed to be reliable, it failed. It's supposed everything it failed. So they are going back to the simpler design now again politics being politics they are destroying this simply because the better design would have been if they had made sls much fatter and they're like okay what, what will the benefit of that more fuel more propellant and add a fifth engine and you would not need srvs and it will simplify the production lineup then why didn't they do it one simple reason politics uh, because the people wanting uh, you know nasa's fund controlling nasa's funding basically they are like hey people were employed everywhere all around the town for a space shuttle project they must retain their job so they created a project in a hurry project uh constellation then constellation failed it was uh, basically over budgeted behind schedule by like 10 years behind schedule and uh, over budget by four or five billion then they created the same project was taken away and made into sls same thing you see here and uh, orion was like also offshoot of that so politics basically so sls is not built because again this is what engineers need this is what space mechanics needs you know it's built because jobs so it is not very efficient in terms of use and these engines uh, the tragedy of these engines is that they are the only engines that were the first to truly be reusable and now they are going to be used and thrown so this tragedy now because uh, they're going to be used and thrown they will be po uh, pushed to 111 uh, percent now this is one thing that many people find it confusing it's like how the heck it can be more than 100 percent think of this the when the rocket engine was built it was long ago so after refinement polish and multiple launches like 100 plus launches of shuttle was done so they had enough time to polish the design uh, they got more pressure uh, more oomph out of it same way uh, Merlin engine got more and more powerful as it you happen so instead of recalibrating everything they simply added more basically instead of like computer knows it's like 100 percent is this uh, this much thrust let's say 100 percent means 100 horsepower they are like okay it's just your 100 percent simply means that but now the newer design can go as high as 104 percent now the even the newer design this one it can go as high as 111 horsepower 111 percent the reason for that uh, if you push it that hard the turbines will start to self-destruct over time but since it's use and throw there is no point in that now, to give you a, a context of the efficiency, what it had achieved in back uh, long ago is basically Raptor engines vacuum uh, efficiency is 380, quite remarkable. But the moment you compare these puppies, these puppies are like 452, basically 70 plus uh, SI uh, efficiency. So when people say this is the most efficient engine, they actually mean it, and it's mathematically true. Like the efficiency these puppies achieved is like whoa, and they achieved in 1970. So. It was amazing engine, but uh, the tragedy of these, like, you know, being awesome, being reusable to just being another engine that you're going to use and throw. So it's kind of tragic, but again, that's politics for you. So this was my presentation on RS25. I hope you liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I'd urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me your extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon for free. And as always, thanks for watching.